welcome to our special 44th Annual Solomon A. Burson Memorial Letter. If you don't mind silencing your papers and cell phones. So Dr. Solomon Burson was an extraordinary physician scientist whose discoveries led to major advances in basic science and clinical medicine. His collaborative work with longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Rosalind Yava, led to breakthroughs in the field of endocrinology and ultimately the development of the radio amino acid. Neither scientist patented, patented these processes, nor profited commercially from their medical and scientific contributions. Dr. Burson later served as chair of the Department of Medicine here at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Unfortunately, he passed away in 1972. In 1977, Dr. Yala received the Nobel Prize for their work. And at their request, the laboratory being shared was designated the Solomon Burson Research Library. Their contributions have shaped modern medicine, and we are thrilled to honor Dr. Burson. Our present our presenter, Dr. Christina Wyatt, exemplifies the unique investigative spirit and selflessness of Dr. Burson. Dr. Wyatt received her medical degree from Duke University. She completed both her residency and her biology fellowship here at Mount Sinai, where she also served as chief resident. She's currently an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Nephrology and now serves as associate chair for clinical and translational research. As director of HIV-related kidney disease clinical studies, a leader in understanding the pathogenesis of HIV-associated nephropathy and a phenomenal clinician, Dr. Wyatt is a truly deserving recipient of this award. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Wyatt. Thank you. Well, it's a, it's a great honor to be here um, at Grand Rounds in general um, speaking, but particularly um, during the Solomon A. Burson uh, lectureship. Um, when I first arrived here as an intern at Mount Sinai, I actually joined the Burson team. So at that time, the teams were organized um, and named after some of the great physicians uh, who had once practiced here at Mount Sinai. And Burson was always my favorite team. Um, it tended to be sort of the most general medicine and the broadest scope of, of patient populations. So um, I've, I've really thought about Dr. Burson ever since I came here. Um, and to be considered somebody in his um, you know, sort of in his uh, model is, is really an honor as well. Um, as, a, as an investigator and a clinician, he really wedded those two things together. Um, and his investigation really addressed questions that were relevant to his patient population. And that's what I um, hope to do and hope to have done um, during my career. So it's, it's really a great pleasure to be here this morning. Um, I have no financial disclosures. Um, I guess I, and I, and I haven't yet profited from any of my discoveries either. So. <laughs> Um, so what I'm going to talk about today um, is kidney disease in the context of HIV and its treatment. Um, and patients with HIV infection are at increased risk for kidney disease from a number of reasons. Um, so patients uh, have an increased risk of acute kidney injury. They have a risk for HIV-associated disease, diseases that are causally related to the virus. Um, certainly comorbid kidney disease, particularly as this population ages and treatment toxicity related to antiretroviral therapy and, and medications for comorbid conditions. And unfortunately, all of these things can contribute to uh, increased risk of chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease in this population. So before I get started, I want to talk about a couple of caveats that are uh, important to keep in the back of your mind when I talk particularly about the more clinical studies in patients with HIV. Um, there are important limitations, particularly of the study cohorts, when you're studying a question about kidney disease. Um, the primary uh, limitation being that these cohorts were largely not developed to study kidney disease. So much of the research that you'll see is, is data coming from either a randomized controlled trial where the question was related to timing of antiretroviral therapy, for example, or a prospective observational cohort where the initial questions were related to AIDS-related morbidity and mortality. Um, so often important data are lacking. Um, some of these cohorts didn't even collect information on kidney disease and obviously can't be used for this type of study. Um, others didn't collect it in a standardized fashion or only collected, for example, a serum creatinine, but no data on urine protein and may not have had rich data on things like diabetes and, and hypertension that would be important traditional risk factors. So that's an important thing just to keep in the back of your mind. Um, the other important thing is uh, not necessarily just unique to HIV infection, but the limitations of our GFR estimates. So really, most of these studies are going to be based on estimating kidney function in some way, um, and GFR estimates aren't perfect in any population, um, but there are some unique um, is issues in the HIV population. Um, and this is a slide, this is just a, pic a picture of the, of the tubule. And uh, you can see things going, um, creatinine is supposed to be filtered from blood to urine, 
Um, and at the same time, there are these transporters that do a lot of different things, um, and some of them interfere with the transport of, um, of creatinine as well. So some of these medications, dolutegravir and integrase inhibitor, um, is probably one of the stronger effects. Um, cobacistat, which is one of the new pharmaco-enhancers, um, a boosting agent like ritonavir, um, has that effect. And when these two drugs first um, were developed, it was noticed that there was sort of a rapid and um, then stable decline in creatinine clearance, or GFR, um, that was related to this effect. Um, when they started to study this in vitro, they discovered that actually there's a similar effect with ritonavir, um, one of the older boosting agents. And so this may, um, th th this will come back um, into play perhaps in some of the discussion later. So this is important when you're looking at somebody, um, somebody's creatinine or GFR estimate in there on one of these medications. Um, the effect is typically the average effect with a drug, for example, like dolutegravir. If you start it um, two weeks later, you repeat a creatinine, the average rise is about 0.2 milligrams per deciliter. Um, it can be, though, that's the average, and so there's, you know, some patients have less of a rise and some patients have more of a rise. Um, I'll say anecdotally, and it makes some sense, that patients um, who have less, lower GFR tend to have a greater rise because proportionally more of their creatinine clearance is, or creatinine um, excretion is coming from, uh, from secretion. So with that said, that's sort of important clinical note to take home is that some of these medications can impact GFR estimates. This is less relevant, the older, or the, the dolutegravir and uh, cobacistat are really don't contribute much to most of the studies that I'm going to talk about today. Um, but whether or not ritonavir um, is affecting some of the studies is, is less clear. Um, so one thing that just may come up in clinical practice is should I be using cystatin C instead um, because it doesn't have this issue with um, interference with drug secretion or with creatinine secretion. Um, cystatin C is not a great alternative in HIV because it comes from all nucleated cells and so it's uh, prone to elevations in the setting of, of systemic inflammation. So um, typically, if you look at a population like patients with hepatitis C, patients with HIV, patients with lupus, um, in all of those cases, cystatin C-based GFR estimates are biased um, by inflammation. So um, cystatin C I do sometimes use in this setting if I have a patient where their creatinine is elevated and they're on dolutegravir and I want to know and they have no proteinuria and there's really nothing else to suggest kidney disease, I will sometimes check a cystatin C. And if I'm lucky and it happens to be normal, then that's reassuring. If it's elevated, I don't necessarily know what to do with it. So um, with that, I will start to talk about um, uh, some of the research that's been done in this area over the last couple of years. Um, this is just, I'm not going to speak about AKI beyond this, but I just think it's important, um, particularly at this point in the year, to remind people that not just in the HIV population, um, these data are from a population with HIV, a veterans population, um, but in the general population as well, that acute kidney injury um, is a predictor of, of adverse outcomes. Um, so these are data from a, a large cohort of uh, veterans um, who were, had an episode of acute kidney injury during hospitalization and survived um, to discharge. And you can see there's this dose-response relationship between acute kidney injury and um, a number of adverse outcomes, so cardiovascular outcomes, end-stage renal disease, and mortality. So AKI, you see it in one of your patients um, when you're on the wards, is a, is a bad prognostic sign. Um, so HIV-associated kidney disease is not something I'm going to spend a whole lot of time on. I'm really going to focus mostly on treatment toxicity today, but I think it's important um, if you're coming from Mount Sinai to know a little bit about this because this is really one of the sites of um, some of the most important work on the pathogenesis of this disease. Um, so a couple of diseases have been causally linked to HIV infection. Um, HIV-associated nephropathy or HIVAN is the most strongly linked. Um, actually, you could probably make the same case for thrombotic microangiopathy, TTP, and HUS, although these are seen much less commonly um, in the antiretroviral era. Um, I have included immune complex kidney disease here, and this um, has been called in a number of things, including HIV immune complex disease or, or HIVIC. Um, it's not clear which, it, often these studies have included sort of a wastebasket of a uh, really heterogeneous collection of immune complex kidney diseases, you know, mesandroproliferative disease and membranous nephropathy and lupus-like nephropathy and IgA nephropathy all in one basket. Um, and it's likely that some of those diseases are causally linked to HIV infection and, and that some of them are coincidental. Um, so I'm really not going to focus on those studies because I think there's really too much work to be done in that area. But um, just to note that there, there are certainly some cases of, of immune complex kidney disease that seem to be um, causally related to HIV infection. 
Um, here, the disease that's been studied the most, um, the most is HIV-associated nephropathy, or HIVAN. This is a disease that typically occurs in patients with advanced um, HIV disease or AIDS, and it responds uh, dramatically to HIV infection. And the pathogenesis work has really um, you know, given us a reason for that, which is this is a disease that's related to direct HIV infection of the kidney, of the kidney epithelial cells with gene expression, and that gene expression drives changes um, in those cells that, that result in a um, collapsing glomerular uh, disease um, with these really pronounced um, tubular and interstitial changes as well. Um, this is a disease that occurs almost exclusively in individuals who are of African descent. Um, and it's, that's uh, largely related um, to uh, polymorphisms in the ApoL1 gene. And although there does seem to be some contribution of African ancestry that's, that's separate from that as well. So this is a disease that we don't see as often now um, because it's a disease that responds really dramatically to antiretroviral therapy. But we do still see a couple of cases here a year. So if your intern's just starting, you will likely see a case at least one during your, um, during your tenure here. Um, and those are typically in patients who are either non-adherent um, to ART or who are um, antiretroviral naive, who either are newly diagnosed or who, for whatever reason, had delayed um, initiation of therapy. But what about chronic kidney disease in patients um, with early HIV infection? Um, because this is really more of the patients that we're seeing now. Um, these are data that are taken from the START trial. START was a, um, a, a landmark clinical trial that supports the current um, recommendations for treatment initiation, for ART initiation. This trial uh, randomized around 4,600 um, antiretroviral na naive adults, all of whom had a CD4 count of greater than 500. Um, to either start C, uh, HIV therapy right away or to defer until they had some clinical indication or their CD4 was less than 350. Now, for those of you who are just learning about HIV treatment now, it sounds like, you know, that's what we do now. We start everybody on, on HIV therapy um, right away. But at the time, these were guidelines that, had, that, that sort of came out right around the time the study was starting, um, but that weren't really based on evidence, but were based on sort of clinical gestalt. It seemed like a good idea to start people on ART earlier, but there wasn't really much to say that that was not without some risk. We know that long-term exposure to ART has its downsides. So, you know, in, in, the, long, in, the, in the balance, which was better? So this study um, addressed that question. It actually was stopped early because the patients um, who deferred in the blue line actually had more um, AIDS and non-AIDS related serious adverse events um, and, and achieved more of the primary outcomes early. So the study was stopped early um, in support of the current guidelines to start everyone on ART right away. So what impact um, does this have on the kidney? So first we looked at um, kidney disease at baseline. So these are patients who are CD4s of greater than 500, um, but otherwise we're a fairly loosely um, uh, restricted cohort for a clinical trial. So um, it's still a clinical, clinical trial cohort. These are still probably more adherent patients than you would get in a, if you looked at the whole population. But there were very few restrictions in terms of comorbid conditions, um, co-medications, and uh, things like GFR. So patients, there, you couldn't have been on dialysis, but otherwise there was no GFR restriction. Um, and despite that, there wasn't a whole lot of um, CKD at baseline. So less than 1% of these participants had a GFR of less than 60, um, and about 6% had proteinuria um, based on urine dipstick. So again, this is one of those studies where, you know, during the study, design, study itself, they weren't collecting any sort of rigorous measures of proteinuria, but they did have urinalysis. So this isn't a whole lot of kidney disease, but this um, is a population with the mean age of 37 years. So this actually is higher than you would expect for age. So if you look at similar uh, populations with a similar age distribution, there shouldn't be nearly this much proteinuria, um, suggesting that there is something here. Um, so then what happens when you start them on antiretroviral therapy? The red arm here is the immediate arm. Um, and the blue arm, it says the deferred arm, I'm, re I'm realizing now, um, is the deferred arm. So these are patients who started um, when they reached some clinical, uh, some clinical endpoint. This is probably in our paper, too. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> and it certainly was in our grant, that, that, that I'm sure of. Um, so, so you can see there's, uh, there's actually a benefit to starting um, antiretroviral therapy early in terms of GFR slope. Um, so for whatever reason, it took a lot of, not a lot of explain in here, some um, regression to the mean, there's a dip in both arms, but then there's a clear separation of the curves um, in favor of starting early ART. So starting um, antiretroviral therapy, regardless of your CD4, in patients with high CD4, still had some advantage in terms of, um, in terms of GFR. Interestingly, there was a very strong interaction with race. 
Um, and this effect was essentially only seen in patients who um, had self-reported black race. So there was no benefit in patients who were white or, or um, you know, of, of other um, ancestry. And you know, this raises the question of whether this is some early sort of high van or HIV-associated kidney disease phenomenon. Um, and we have data, um, we're collecting data now on APOL1 status to sort of look to see whether that's a contributing factor here. So again, this suggests that at least, at least early on, um, starting antiretroviral therapy early in patients with, with HIV is, is a benefit. Um, so interestingly, the spectrum of, of kidney disease has really changed with the introduction of antiretroviral therapy. So these are data from Hopkins, um, where they would biopsy all, all of us if we happen to wander by too close. Um, they have very, you know, they're, they're very aggressive about understanding the, um, the spectrum of disease in this population. So they have a really large biopsy series there, and we actually collaborate on them, with them on a number of studies. Um, because w they do a lot more biopsies there than we do. Um, and so you can see here, 1996 was the, the introduction of um, combination antiretroviral therapy in the United States. And this is the proportion of their biopsies that, that showed high van. So patients that showed up, um, wandered past Moada's office and got biopsied. Um, of, those, of those patients, you can see that, that almost 80% of them in 1997 had high van. Um, and that proportion really declined over time. And this, this decline has continued. They haven't made a graph that's as nice as this in, that since then, but now they're seeing um, you know, very few cases of high van out of their biopsies. Um, what they're seeing instead, um, and what we're seeing instead, is um, non-collapsing focal segmental glomerulus sclerosis. So high van is a collapsing form of FSGS. Um, so they're seeing this just FSGS without all the tubular um, changes, without the collapse, um, and whether or not this is uh, related to HIV infection, or this is an APOL1 mediated disease, or there's something else, um, is not clear. Um, and this is an area of, of study. I'm not going to present any data because we don't know the answer to that question yet. But I think this is the most common diagnosis that we're seeing now in this population is sort of non high van FSGS. But we're also seeing a lot of diabetic nephropathy and a lot of um, what looks like hypertensive. Um, kidney disease, it's sometimes in patients without hypertension, um, as well as this immune complex disease that I mentioned before. Um, we're seeing less drug toxicity on biopsy. We see some, um, mostly because I think when we suspect this, we're stopping the drugs instead of doing biopsies. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about comorbid kidney disease. Um, Comorbid uh, disease is common in this population, and, and in general, CKD risk factors, traditional risk factors like diabetes and hypertension, um, black race, um, and hepatitis virus infection are all more common in patients with HIV than in the general population. So as this population ages, there really is an increasing prevalence of um, comorbid kidney disease. When I sit, um, I'm leaving from here to go to the HIV clinic where I see patients twice a month, um, and they're you know, just like one floor above in the fellows um, uh, general nephrology clinic, most of the patients that I see have diabetic nephropathy, um, but they have not diabetic nephropathy with a twist. Um, you know, they have HIV as well. Often they have hepatitis C. They may be on a nephrotoxic medication or two. Um, so it, it, it's certainly an interesting place to see patients, um, but still, just like the general population, diabetic nephropathy really is, is the, probably the most common thing that we see. Um, and it seems that HIV may have some additive effect on um, comorbid disease. These are data, again, from a veteran's population. Um, this is the Veterans Aging Cohort Study, or VAX. Um, and we looked at patients who had GFRs above 45 um, and who declined by at least 25% to a GFR less than, 20, uh, than 45. And you can see that these are the patients with um, out HIV or diabetes, and down here are the patients with both. Um, and you can see that decline um, to that endpoint is much more rapid in patients who have both diabetes and HIV um, compared to, to either alone or to, or to neither. Um, and this effect is um, also seen in uh, mouse models. So if you take an HIV transgenic mouse on a genetic background that typically doesn't get kidney disease, typically that mouse wouldn't develop high van. So the high van mouse has been an incredibly um, rich source of studies for pathogenesis of, of high van, but it doesn't develop on all genetic backgrounds. So you put the um, HIV transgenes, oop, I pushed some button, do you know, or am I, I'm back, okay, good, uh, I lost, I could, I could hear myself echoing for a second there, so I knew it would. <laughs> Um, so the, this, this transgenic um, animal model on a background that wouldn't typically develop high van, if you then um, induce uh, diabetes in that mouse, that mouse gets, uh, gets disease. So normally the mouse, uh, black six mice, for example, wouldn't get 
um, diabetic nephropathy or um, high van if you, if you put it in the right conditions, but if you give, the, give it both, um, then there is disease there. So again, there's something um, additive or, or maybe synergistic. In the clinical study, we couldn't, um, the test for, the statistical tests for synergy were not positive. But in the animal model, it certainly looks like there's some synergy between the two, um, and it appears to be related to inflammatory pathways that are upregulated um, in both conditions. So again, having HIV and, and diabetes um, doesn't seem to be a good, doesn't sound like it'd be a good combination, um, and it's certainly not a good combination um, for, for your kidneys. And this does seem to be consistent with what we see in clinical practice. When I'm on the third floor seeing patients with diabetic nephropathy, I feel like I'm starting them on dialysis much more often, um, the HIV positive individuals, than the patients who are floor up with the same disease. So um, there is certainly something here clinically as well. Um, so with this multimorbidity comes polypharmacy, um, and you can imagine this is a patient population that may struggle with adherence. Um, these are data from, um, from one of the uh, Mount Sinai House staff when he was a, um, a, a Mount Sinai student here, um, looking at adherence in patients with HIV and chronic kidney disease. Um, we joined forces with Jeff Weiss, who is a psychologist in the general medicine department, um, who's um, interested in, in adherence in the setting of HIV and um, hepatitis, and who had already started a study looking at hypertension um, and uh, patients with HIV. And so we added a cohort of patients with um, chronic kidney disease. These patients were monitored for adherence using an electronic um, monitoring cap. So you take it off and, and it, um, it shows off. There's something called curiosity openings where you take it off and look, just look in the bottle and put the top back on. It doesn't necessarily mean you took the pill, but um, in general, it's, it's considered the gold standard for adherence monitoring, um, as well as some surveys about um, medication and illness beliefs. Um, and interestingly, this was turned out to be a fairly adherent population that we enrolled, which is, I guess, pretty consistent with most, um, with most clinical studies. Um, and this, the patients were similarly adherent um, to antiretroviral therapy and to hyper meds for typically antihypertensives were the most common medications, but um, some additional medications that were used for chronic kidney disease. Um, and this was despite the fact that they almost um, universally expressed sort of a stronger belief in the need for their medications for HIV. So, you know, despite the fact that some of these patients had pretty advanced chronic kidney disease, they really thought that their antiretroviral therapy medication was the most important thing that they were taking. But nonetheless, they took, um, tended to take both sets of medications. I suspect that if you looked at patients on the other end of the spectrum who didn't, who weren't so adherent with their hypertensive medications, that many of them are also less adherent um, to their ART, but these patients are diff more difficult to engage in studies. Um, but I do think what this suggests is that, that things that increase adherence to one are likely to increase adherence to another. Um, this uh, study was done um, by Giannis Constantinidis, who is now um, one of our residents, and uh, who I think spoke up yesterday. I understand you guys had a journal club on the last topic that I'm going to talk about today, which is treatment toxicity. And I'll really spend most of the rest of the time um, talking about this. So, I've just included here, um, because I think it's important to know this, a number of the, of the brand names. Um, and the reason for that is that most patients come in and they don't know the four drugs or three drugs that are part of one of their fixed dose combinations. They know the brand name, um, if that, or they know it's the purple pill or whatever, but, um, but, but you then can look it up on the chart. So, um, so th th these are sort of some of the drugs that are, uh, or the fixed dose combinations that include uh, tenofovir, disaproxyl fumarate. I used to just say tenofovir, um, but there's now a new form which will come back and talk about. Um, so these are the drugs that are included there. I've included indenivir um, or crixivan. Probably none of you um, who are interns will see patients on this drug, although occasionally um, somebody will still show up on it. Um, and certainly there are a lot of patients who I see who were taking this. This is one of the earlier protease inhibitors um, that was um, associated with a sort of unacceptably high rate of uh, nephrolithiasis, urolithiasis, and interstitial nephritis. And we still sometimes see patients who have um, you know, sort of long-term complications from having been on indenivir in the past. Um, some of the newer protease inhibitors also are associated with stone disease. Um, in fact, almost all of them have been associated with a case or two. Um, but adizanivir probably has more, um, more reports and actually has a, a warning in, the, in, in its package insert um, about stone disease. And, and in particular, adizanivir and lopinavir have been associated in multiple um, epidemiologic studies with some CKD outcome, whether it's decreased creatinine clearance um, or uh, or you know, rapid decline in GFR. So these, these are sort of the, the, the key leaders, um, but any of the boosted protease inhibitors, perhaps with the exception of darunavir, have been associated at least in some studies. 
Um, so I'm going to spend most of the time talking about tenofovir because this is the one where I think the, the data are the most conclusive. Um, as I mentioned before, with the, um, with the protease inhibitors, there's this question of how much of these, at least the epidemiologic studies, are driven by ritonavir and that ritonavir effect on creatinine and creatinine clearance or, or, or GFR. Um, and so I think there, there's certainly a strong enough signal, and that signal is seen with some protease inhibitors boosted with ritonavir and not so much with others, suggesting that there's a true effect. Um, but there is a little bit of controversy these days about what the role of ritonavir is all, in all of those studies. Um, but tenofovir is pretty unequivocal. Um, this was a drug that's it's related actually to sidofovir and adefovir, both of which in their pre-marketing trials and in, in clinical practice with sidofovir are known to be associated with proximal tubular injury. So this is a drug that's chemically related. Um, in the initial pre-marketing clinical trials, they were really paying attention to this. They were looking for a signal and didn't really see much. Um, but as soon as the drug hit the market, there you know, start to be case, you know, reports of, um, of proximal tubular injury and um, you know, in a population, a real world population that's always slightly less healthy um, than the clinical trial population. So um, this is a drug that affects the proximal tubules. Um, it causes proximal tubular uh, injury or death. Um, when it's causing injury, patients will develop um, proximal signs of proximal tubular dysfunction. So patients start to leak pro proteins, they start to leak um, uh, amino acids, they start to leak phosphorus, and they start to leak glucose. So if you look at a urinalysis, you may see a little bit of protein. Sometimes you'll see um, euglycemic glycosuria glucose in the urine in the absence of an elevated serum glucose, which is pretty specific for proximal tubular injury. There aren't a whole lot of reasons sugar winds up in your urine. Um, and if you do biopsy someone, so as, as I mentioned, most of these patients are, are, you know, at least early on, were presenting with classic enough, um, you know, Fanconi syndrome, proximal tubular um, injury, that we didn't biopsy them, that we would just switch their medications. Um, but if you did do a biopsy, you would see really profound proximal tubular damage. Um, is there, there, I think I cropped out the more, the more normal look, looking tubule, but these are, these are really dramatically altered tubules. They're supposed to have nice little fuzzy brush border here, the nice packed together nuclei, and all of that is lost. Um, on electron microscopy, um, without having to be a, a pathologist, you can see that these are not normal looking mitochondria. They don't have those nice little lines in them that they're supposed to have. They're a little bit large. Um, and this is a disease that's, that's associated with significant mitochondrial damage. On, um, on pathology. And so the thought is that this is a mitochondrial um, toxicity mechanism, um, similar to the other, this is, tenofovir is a nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitor related to the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And you know, particularly some of the older ones of those drugs are associated with lactic acidosis, which is also a mitochondrial um, injury. So th this mechanism is still being worked out, but it's certainly, it's, it's pretty clear that they're at least somewhere along the pathway is, is mitochondrial image, uh, damage. So the first cases were all associated with proximal tubular damage because that's what people were really looking for. Um, but if you look back at the pre-marketing uh, clinical trials and also cohort studies that were done early on, um, there's also a, a sort of a signal for creatinine clearance decline or GFR decline. These, these studies were all looking at creatinine clearance um, and the pooled risk, this is a, a meta-analysis of all of these studies and the pooled um, uh, change in creatinine clearance favors anything other than tenofovir. So these were all patients who were started on tenofovir versus, some, versus something else. A bunch of different types of regimens. Um, and and um, overall, it looks like tenofovir is associated with a greater decline in creatinine clearance as well. Um, and in clinical practice, this is actually what we're seeing more often. I think I'm not seeing a whole lot of patients who come in with Frank Fanconi syndrome and proximal tubular injury and you know, breaking bones from, from phosphorus loss. But we see a lot of patients with this sort of uh, what one of my colleagues used to call creatinine creep. So the creatinine is sort of gradually um, going up over time without a whole lot else going on. And whether this is related to tenofovir, whether this is related to their comorbid conditions and their aging and their other medications is always tough to tease out. Um, but it does look like when you sort of take all things into consideration that tenofovir is contributing in some way to this as well. Um, tenofovir is also associated with an increase in proteinuria. Um, so these are data from a sub-study of a, a randomized clinical trial that was comparing two um, NRTI combinations, um, TDF um, and emtricitabine and abacavir and lamivudine. And you can see these are these, when these patients were started on um, TDF versus abacavir, there was an increase in their urine protein creatinine ratio and in their urine albumin to creatinine ratio. This effect is smaller but still seen. 
Um, and, and, you know, this seems to persist over time as well. And this also we see in clinical practice patients just, you know, starting to develop a little bit of proteinuria over time. Um, it looks like this tubulopathy part of it, the sort of the Fanconi syndrome component is reversible. Um, so we actually um, and others have done some case control studies looking at patients with um, tenofovir toxicity. And if you follow them over time, um, the tubular changes tend to reverse, which makes sense. Tubules can regenerate. Um, but the GFR um, often does not fully recover. So if patients have gotten to the point where, you, they're cl where it's clinically evident, um, then often the GFR doesn't come back to baseline. Um, risk factors that have been identified in these studies included the use of a boosted protease inhibitor. Um, and I'm just adding here, this was not, has not been shown in any of those studies, but I'm adding it here because clinically it's relevant to this audience. Um, Lidiposphere has a similar effect in increasing tenofovir concentrations. Um, so when patients are starting um, therapy with Harvoni, which is the combination of sofosbuvir, lidiposphere for hep C, which we do a lot here, um, then you know, ideally they should be switched off a TDF-containing regimen, um, and certainly they shouldn't be on one with a boosted protease inhibitor because that combination of all three is, um, is sort of a classic uh, recipe for, for toxicity. Um, these studies also identified lower baseline creatinine clearance, female sex, and low body weight um, as sort of, predict, as sort of uh, reproducible risk factors for tenofovir toxicity. Um, and all of these uh, tend to cause a higher plasma concentration of tenofovir. Um, so TDF is a prodrug. Um, tenofovir actually is, is also still sort of a prodrug. It has to be activated inside cells. But this is, the, this is what floats around in plasma. And the higher plasma concentrations of tenofovir um, appear to be what's driving the the toxicity. Um, so sort of with that in mind, um, the manufacturer um, pulled back out one of the other prodrugs that they had developed actually at the same time as TDF and hadn't really studied much further. Um, this one called tenofovir alafenamide or TAF um, and started to look at whether this drug was associated with lower toxicity. And the reason they thought it might be is because um, it's, it, um, it basically has a different mechanism. It's, absor it's absorbed as the prodrug um, instead of largely, TDF is mostly absorbed as, as tenofovir. This is absorbed as TAF and it sits around in the plasma as TAF and, is a re and then is absorbed as tenofovir into cells. Um, so there's lower plasma concentrations of tenofovir and this, the thought was this, maybe this will be associated with less toxicity. Um, and it certainly looks like that's the case. So these are um, creatinine clearance data from one of the early phase two trials. They haven't made pretty figures like this from the studies that have been published. But, um, and you can see there's the, the regimen here includes the C is for cobacistat. Um, and so you can see in both arms, these are ART naive patients were started on a regimen containing the same three things, cobacistat and either TAF or TDF. Um, and this is sort of the cobacistat effect here. So we talked about that before, the interference with creatinine secretion. So that happens in both arms. But then there's a difference in the creatinine clearance in the two arms over time that favors um, the new prodrug TAF. Um, and these results are similar if you look at the phase three studies. Um, and at the extension of the phase three studies, there actually starts to be some difference in clinically relevant events. So this is a tiny little difference in creatinine clearance that I'm not sure I really care much about. Um, and the, there hasn't been enough real world use yet to say whether or not this is really gonna translate into a huge difference in clinical outcomes. Um, but the 96 week data from these trials is starting to show a difference in incidents, for example, of proximal tubular injury or clinically relevant GFR decline. So I think it's likely um, that this new prodrug is gonna be safer, um, both for kidney, and I haven't talked about bone, but also potentially for bone. Um, there um, also seems to be some benefit in terms of, um, of proteinuria. So these are patients who were started on, again, the same sort of regimen except for TAF versus TDF. And you can see there's more proteinuria um, in the patients who are started on TDF compared to TAF in purple. So again, the same effect on proteinuria. If you look at other sort of fancier biomarkers like your beta-2 microglobulin or retinal binding protein markers of proximal tubular function, um, that you also see a similar effect if you either start patients naive or if you switch patients from TDF to TAF. So suggesting that there's likely to be a clinically um, relevant difference, but I think only time will tell. Um, so why would not everybody be switched um, from TDF to TAF is a question that comes up. Um, right now they're comparably priced, um, although the t most of the TDF-based combinations are, are going to start coming off patent soon, so I think the price difference will, will be a factor soon. Um, right now you have to get prior authorization for the TAF-based combination, so I think that's one deterrent. 
Um, but there, you know, again, there, it's, it's a new drug, and I think you know a lot of us know that it, you know new drugs come with new complications, um, and so I think there's a little bit of wariness to see whether there's going to be something um, that's not good about being on it. The one thing that so far is is known is that. Um, TDF seems to have a beneficial effect on, on lipids, um, and that effect is not seen with TAF. So if you switch somebody from TDF to TAF, you actually see a rise in lipids, which you know, may or may not be clinically significant in all patients, but, um, but certainly is something that I've had patients sort of panic about. Their, my lipids have gone up. I'm like, well, it's probably because you switched from this to that. So it's, you know, it's not everything we do in medicine comes at some cost. Um, I just want to go back and, and just as a reminder that this is not the only drug that's associated with, tof with, to not, with toxicity. Um, these are data from a, um, a European cohort, the Uraceta cohort, um, where they looked at cumulative use of a number of um, antiretroviral agents compared to no use of that agent. Um, and so tenofovir, cumulative use longer, this is greater than three years here, was associated with um, a significant increase in um, confirmed creatinine clearance of less than 60. So that was at least two measures less than 60. Um, but the same effect was seen with indenivir. This was the first time, actually, this was in 2010, this is the first time atazanivir had that signal. Um, and it was about the same time that the FDA was adding the warning label about stones. So this created a bunch of furor at the time. Um, and a lot of people switching off atazanivir, probably who could have done fine um, on the drug. Although, you know, if patients come in with stones, I often suggest switching. And if they come in with no other explanation for kidney dysfunction, um, then I don't think it's an unreasonable thing to consider. Um, so back to the start. If there are this number of agents that are associated with, um, with, with toxicity, then what is it, you know, what's the effect of being on ART long term? So again, these are the data that, that um, I showed you before and that have been published. Um, but if you follow these curves out, actually, um, they converge and, and appear to cross. So this, again, is the immediate therapy arm. And you can see that after about three years, there's actually a greater decline in GFR in that arm compared to the, um, to the immediate therapy arm. And uh, we actually are looking now sort of at, at these time points using bank samples to see if we can explain what's happening here and whether this is, um, it seems likely to be an ART toxicity effect. Um, the convergence of the curves we thought initially was, was just related to the initiation of ART in most of the patients in the deferred therapy arm. So, you know, somewhere around here, um, everybody's on ART. And so it makes sense that there's less, um, you know, difference between the two arms. But then this, this does suggest that there's, there may be something related to long-term exposure to ART that's not good. And the vast majority, about 80% of the patients in this trial were started on a TDF-containing regimen. Um, so we're not going to be able to look at any of the new agents. We won't really have any power to look at differences between TDF and TAF, for example. Um, but we will hopefully be able to answer some of these questions, um, for example, related to, uh, to the effect of ritonavir um, on, the, on the protease inhibitor effect. So hopefully in a few years, I'll be able to come back and report on, on more on that. Um, I want to switch gears for, for the last few minutes and talk about um, sort of the role of the kidney in HIV prevention and cure efforts. Um, the, the reason I'm interested in this is um, because TDF-FTC, um, one of the TDF-containing regimens, is the only currently approved regimen for pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV infection. So this is drugs that you take every day to prevent HIV infection. Um, obviously, these are healthy individuals who don't have HIV, and so most of us would have a lower tolerance for adverse effects. Um, and you know, the good news was in the pre-marketing trials for, for PrEP, there was really no signal for kidney injury. Um, but when you think about this, these are largely healthy young adults. Um, they you know, had strict inclusion criteria. They couldn't be on nephrotoxic medications, for example. They couldn't have you know, traditional risk factors for CKD. They couldn't have CKD. Um, these patients were watched like hawks because they were healthy individuals, and the NIH largely um, imposed really strict um, you know, DSMBs and monitoring panels on these. Um, I was on the protocol committee for one of them, and it was, uh, you know, I, I can't tell you how many urine phosphorus and serum phosphorus study levels I got called about over the course of a few years. Um, so these patients were really watched very closely, and if anything happened, they stopped drug. Um, and in addition to that, nobody took it. So most of these studies, <laughs> most of these studies, the adherence was terrible. Um, and so some of the studies actually were negative, didn't show a benefit of PrEP because nobody took the drug. The studies that did show, um, or the subgroups where, where adherence was high was where the benefit was seen. But you can imagine, you, you know, you don't get toxicity either. The drug may not work, but you also don't get side effects if you don't take it. So. Um, we were interested in, in whether or not there really was some safety issue um, with PrEP in this population. 
Um, this is uh, a, a meta-analysis done by um, two of our former fellows, both of whom are no now faculty in nephrology, um, one here and one at Buffalo. And uh, they looked at um, all of the pre-marketing trials of um, TDF-based PrEP um, and pulled together, there is an increase in the um, rate of creatinine events. So these studies didn't look at, at creatinine clearance decline, but they did look at, at graded creatinine events, and graded creatinine events tend to be like a 0.2 milligram per deciliter increase, for example, would be a grade one event. Um, and so there was an increased risk of these events in patients who are randomized to, um, to active PrEP. And you can see this is despite the fact that, you know, adherence in some of these studies was less than 50%. Um, when we looked at a study with high adherence, this is the Partners PrEP study. This was a study that randomized um, the HIV negative partner in a serodiscordant couple, meaning their partner was HIV positive. So you knew when you went, you know, when you, when you slept with someone that they were HIV positive, their adherence was much higher. So this population had um, adherence of greater than 80%. In this cohort, um, we, we actually have done some, some additional studies and some secondary analysis. You can see that there's a separation of the GFR curves um, after about two years that favors the active, I mean, the, the placebo arm. So again, there's more GFR decline in patients who were randomized to active PrEP. Um, and actually, in the active PrEP arms, there were two patients um, who developed, who got as far as a GFR less than 60. Um, at 30 and 36 months, and both of these were stopped. Drug was stopped at that point. Um, there's a similar um, sub-study of the IPREX trial, which is a trial largely in um, uh, uh, Latin American men having sex with men, and they found similar results there. Again, so a, a separation of the curves that looks very similar to what was seen in the original trials um, with uh, TDF for HIV treatment. Um, so we then also looked back at um, at proximal tubular injury. These were not markers that were measured um, in the partner's PrEP trial during the study. Um, and using banked samples, um, only looked at the TDF-FTC arm since that's the FDA-approved um, FDA treatment. Although similar changes were seen with GFR and the TDF arm. Um, we didn't see any difference between TDF-FTC and, and placebo in terms of proximal tubular injury if you measured it, if you required a couple of markers, if you required at least two markers of proximal tubular injury. But we did see a lot more non-albumin proteinuria. So this was proteinuria that was largely tubular uh, proteinuria um, in the active PrEP arm. And there was one case of, um, of overt Fanconi syndrome. So this patient had glycosuria, had aminoacidaria, had uric uricosuria, um, and low serum phosphate that was not captured for this reason during the trial, but was actually one of those patients that had the GFR declined to less than 60. So this patient had had treatment interrupted in the trial as a result of a GFR outcome, but also in the background had Fanconi syndrome. Um, interestingly, this patient was, um, at some point, he was not at the time of entry because it was an exclusion criteria, but at some point during the trial had been started on some nephrotoxic antifungal agent um, that may have been a contributing factor. Because um, if you imagine if your GFR declines, then your creatinine, uh, then your tenofovir levels go up and your risk for toxicity um, increases, regardless of what the, you know, concomitant nephrotoxin is. So I think overall the risk of nephrotoxicity um, and probably BMD decline based on the studies that are coming out um, is lower in an HIV negative population than it is in an HIV positive, but it's not zero. Um, and interestingly, there are you know, pretty variable guidelines for how to monitor this population. I think most um, patients here, um, I don't know if any of the, the um, sort of general medicine doctors here are seeing patients for PrEP. Um, a lot of those patients are coming to the HIV providers, and I think they're still sort of following sort of their usual, you know, quarterly or at least twice a year monitoring just because that's what they're accustomed to. But if you think about starting um, high-risk populations, for example, sexually active women in Africa who have an incredibly high rate of um, HIV um, acquisition, if you, you know, want to put a, a, a large population of, of patients there on, um, on antiretroviral prophylaxis, then you really sort of have to think about sort of what the the you know, cost benefit is of, of screening um, in this population. So there's a lot of work going on to see how often we really need to monitor um, patients who are HIV negative without a lot of risk factors who are on PrEP. Um, and sort of the, the question that comes up here is why aren't people just using TAF instead? Um, and the reason for that is, is well, one is it's not currently approved. Um, it's not FDA approved for PrEP, so you probably couldn't get it paid for. Um, but the other reason is it's, it, one of the reasons it's not approved yet is because it's not 100% clear that it will work. Um, there's certainly some, some things to suggest that it will, and it's being studied for this indication now, 
Um, but we do know that, um, that the level, for example, in mucosal cells is much lower than the, le the tenofovir levels in mucosal cells with TAF is much lower than the uh, levels with TDF. So if you need mucosal um, antiviral effect, then it may not be as effective. So um, I, I think most people would like to wait to see if it actually works before they make the switch. Um, certainly I think people would, would like that if it, if it did, but um, right now we're not, not, able, not quite ready to do that. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is the kidney um, and, and the idea of HIV cure research, um, which is sort of where, if, if you go to the HIV meetings now, that's the, where, the, where the most excitement is um, and has been for a long time, although still, we're still not there. Um, the, the reason this, this may be relevant is because we know the kidney is infected, um, and the kidney is infected early in HIV infection, um, and it's, there's infection in, in tubular epithelial cells and podocytes, which are the glomerular epithelial cells. Um, and this has been studied mostly in the context of HIV-N, but if you look at biopsies from um, other diseases, you can also find infection there. Um, so could the kidney serve as a reservoir? So a reservoir would be uh, you know, an area where the virus can replicate independently and where if you stop ART, the virus can escape and sort of repopulate the periphery from that, um, from that compartment. Um, and uh, Ben Chen, who I see here, and um, Mary Klotman's group at Duke have done some work to get really nice work together um, studying this question. Um, and the, this is just one figure um, from, from a paper where they essentially took um, CD4 cells that were infected and they sorted them. So they picked out the infected ones that are, that are GFP positive. They um, then co-culture them with primary uh, T cells, a, a tubular epithelial cell line. Um, then they sort out the infected T cells, or I'm sorry, the infected tubular epithelial cells, co-culture them with uninfected CD4 cells, and then you can reinfect those cells. So suggesting that there's sort of bi-directional transfer of virus from CD4 cells to T cells, and then, I mean, to tubular epithelial cells, and then back. Um, so suggesting that there's at least the potential for the kidney to serve as a reservoir. This, the kidney can reinfect um, uh, you know, circulating, for example, or some infiltrating uh, CD4 cell. Um, and I'm going to end with this. These are, these are just uh, trees that are taken from urine. Um, and I put this in here mostly to remind myself that if you guys are seeing patients with HIV and acute tubular necrosis who are shedding cells in the urine, um, that's where the yield for this is the highest. But um, this group is able to, um, to amplify virus from the urine, that we don't have to have a kidney biopsy to do this. Um, and the ATN patients are a really rich resource for this, but they're really tough to find. Um, so if you guys see any, give me a call. Um, <laughs> and with that, I will um, end. I'd just like to thank um, some of the people who have contributed to this work, and, um, and I'll start here with the people who've really contributed to my career. Um, a lot of this work was either done with or inspired by Paul and Mary Klotman, who have been um, two mentors and were sort of some of the leaders in the high van pathogenesis world um, here prior. Um, and then Barbara Murphy and, and C. Jang He have been an incredible source of support to me um, as I sort of continued my faculty development here. Um, the PrEP studies have been done in collaboration, as I mentioned, with the Partners PrEP trial, particularly with Jared Baton, who's the PI on that trial, and Kenneth Maguania. Um, Girish and um, Robbie were two fellows um, who are now faculty who did a, a lot of the, who did the systematic analysis, uh, systematic review. And uh, Girish has also done some other AKI work in this field with me. Um, I mentioned Giannis and Jeff on the adherence study. Um, my colleagues from VAX, including, I'll point out Raj Metapali, who was also a fellow here. Um, so um, with that, I would like to say thanks to all of you. Questions, Emma? So uh, you showed us a study in mice where diabetes plus HIV were additive in terms mm -hmm. of deleterious effects. So I'm wondering whether, number one, whether that's been extended to human observations, and number two, if you add the drug treatment for HIV as you would in, a, in people, does that make things better or worse? Sure, so actually, um, I, so I should clarify, so the, the figure is actually from the human trial. Um, so these are, these are veterans um, who, who had a GFR, preserved GFR at the beginning and then um, were followed over about a median of about five years. Um, and so these are the patients with no HIV or diabetes and these are the people with both. And you can see their, their decline is more rapid. Um, so this was adjusted for um, ART medications, um, but it's not perfect. Um, so this was, I, I'm trying to think, 
Actually, before adjustment, these two curves were flipped. So that could, I mean, it could be a number of things. It could, I mean, we adjusted for everything at once. It could have been, you know, comorbid conditions. It could have been age, um, but it could have been a contribution of the ART medications that HIV, that diabetes actually had, was a more rapid decline before we adjusted. So it's possible that ART had some beneficial effect. Congratulations. Uh, I, I heard estimates that as many or as high a percentage as 90% of the viruses in the reservoir are not competent. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you've looked at the competence of the urine-derived viruses. Sure, I have not. Um, ben and Mary may have. I mean, it can reinfect. I mean, those were those urine-derived. Those were those were T cells that were that were primary T cells that were purchased. I think, right? They were, I think, off the shelf. So they're not urine derived, but they are tubular epithelial cells. Um, and those cells, when infected, um, could then reinfect um, T cells. So suggesting there's at least some level of competence. Whether they're as fit as a virus um, you know, in a T cell, I, I don't know. Um, I think Mary's sequences are all partial sequences thus far, so yeah. from the patients. That's a good question. Thanks very much. Uh, <clears throat> I've said this before, I'm one of the few people old enough in this audience to have known Saul Burson. <clears throat> and he was, as uh, many know, a very lovable and brilliant person. Uh, he was a violinist and a great bridge player and he loved his medical research. <laughs> and he was obviously very comfortable working with very talented women. Mm -hmm. So his partner in the Nobel Prize that she received his partner, uh, Rosalind Yellow, <clears throat> was in the same dingy basement, basement of the VA hospital that he was in after he gave up his practice in Roslyn, New York. He was a private practitioner who felt the need for more stimulus. <clears throat> and uh, so that's, that's just my modest contribution to your terrific lecture. I'll have to take up the violin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, so, Christina, how, how does April oil affect drug toxicity? Is there an influence of gene effect? That's a great question. So far, there hasn't, certainly for tenofovir, um, the risk actually appears to be higher in non blacks. Um, and again, these are all, this is a mix of self reported black race and, you know, the registrar reported them as black race kind of, um, kind of designations. But at least the studies so far suggest that, that um, there's less risk in that population, um, probably related to some other genetic factors. Um, so, so it hasn't really been very aggressively studied for that reason, but we do have the ability, and that's one of the things we're planning to look at in the START cohort. Thank you, Christina, for this and all the years of Denmark. Um, on the Apple one, um, have you looked at our work, because we enroll a lot of people in the, um, with the biobank, mm -hmm. have you looked at our population? We have not. We actually put in a grant about a year ago to look at it that wasn't funded, um, but we, uh, so we haven't done it, but we, we could. I think they've actually done, at the time they hadn't finished all the genotyping, they've done most of it now, so we could probably do some of the work without funding. It's a good question. Great. Thank you very thanks much. Thanks, everyone. I can think of no one more well-deserving of this award, so congratulations, <laughs> Christina, and thanks for having this talk. Thank you. Thank you.